Hello and welcome to the lesson where we finally move from the theory of Gauss's law to making use of it in solving physics problems. So what we've understood so far is that Gauss's law can be applied to a distribution of charges and for any shape of closed surface through which flux passes and we might be interested in finding electric field at the surface or a point on this surface. So seeing the formula, we can say that Gauss's law can be used in two ways. One is if we know the charge distribution inside the closed Gaussian surface, which should also have symmetry, we can find the field value E at the surface. The other way is we establish the charge distribution if we know the field value. So let us use Gauss's law in both ways and get more familiar with the law and its application in this lesson. Well, before we go ahead, let us remember one important aspect of excess charge placed on a conductor, and that is if you place charge on a conductor that may be a solid of any shape or even a sheet, the excess charge will spread itself on the surface of the conductor and no excess charge will go inside of the solid material. Uh, just a small condition here is that the solid should be stationary and not moving. And also since we are now getting into the problem solving mode, a few other important things to remember are one, Gauss's law can be applied easily if the charge distribution is symmetric. And when I say symmetric, it means charge on let's say a sphere, cylinder or any kind of a planar surface. Number two is the thing we should ask ourselves when solving a numerical problem is what is the symmetric Gaussian surface we should consider? Well, it depends on the problem or more accurately the shape of the solid we are considering where the charge resides. So if the solid under consideration has a spherical symmetry, we would take a concentric spherical Gaussian surface. If it happens to be a cylinder, we would take a coaxial cylinder as the Gaussian surface and if the solid carrying charge is a plane, well, we do not take another planar surface, but a cylindrical surface placed like this with its ends parallel to the plane. Number three is figure out what is the right size of the Gaussian surface you wish to use and where this surface should be placed. So if you wish to find the field value at some given point, then the Gaussian surface you choose must include that point. So if you're asked to find electric field, say at this point from the cylinder, you could use this as the Gaussian surface such that the surface passes through the point. Well, all this may sound confusing to you, but as we move ahead and work on some examples you will get a lot more clarity till then hold on and focus so let us start with our first example where we take some positive charge and spread it across the surface of a solid conducting sphere that has radius capital r then the question is what is the value of electric field e inside the sphere and outside or let us say at any radius value r greater than zero. Well, we know that the charge we've put on the sphere is on the surface only and does not go inside the sphere. And since the charge can move freely on the surface, it has no preference for any particular place on the sphere and is therefore symmetrically spread across it. This symmetry in turn tells us that the electric field E should be uniform and pointing radially outwards. So the value of E should depend only on the radial distance from the center and would be the same on any Gaussian surface we choose. So let us try to find the value of E at radius R that is greater than R. To do so, step one is to take a Gaussian surface that has value R. Now we can see that the entire charge is enclosed within the Gaussian surface. We can also see 
that the electric field E is perpendicular to any area element on the sphere. So the flux through this sphere at every point that has area dA should be E dot dA and that should equal E dA cos 0 that equals E dA and the surface integral of E dA should give us the total flux and this integral can be rewritten as E integral dA and integral of dA we know is just the total area A which is 4 pi r square. So total flux is equal to E times A which equals E times 4 pi r square. But Gauss's law tells us that this flux should equal Q upon E naught. Therefore we see that E is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon Q upon r square and you can see that this is a familiar expression for electric field at a distance r due to a point charge q now if you decide to take r equal to capital r electric field at the surface of the sphere equals 1 upon 4 pi epsilon q upon capital r square now let us go ahead and find what is electric field for r value less than capital R. Well, that is quite easy. The equation for Gauss's law is flux is equal to E 4 pi r square equals Q enclosed divided by epsilon. And we realize that Q enclosed here is zero because all the charge is on the surface only. And therefore the E value becomes zero. And well, if we reduce the radius r of the sphere towards zero, the charge sphere becomes a point charge and the field anyway can be given as q upon 4 pi epsilon r square. So you see, in a way we have just derived Coulomb's law from Gauss's law while earlier we had derived Gauss's law from Coulomb's law. So in a way you see that they are quite the same. So if you were to make a graph of field value from center of the sphere versus the distance from the center, this is how it would look like. You get zero field value from radius r equal to zero to r less than capital R. Then at r equal to capital R, suddenly the E value will jump to one upon four pi epsilon q upon capital R square and then it will fall as a square of the distance r from the center and e equals 1 upon 4 pi epsilon q upon r square. Well, I would guess you are slowly getting a sense of Gauss's law. So let us take this understanding further with another example where we take positive electric charge spread uniformly on an infinitely long wire with lambda as a charge per unit length. And we are then asked to find the electric field E using Gauss's law at a distance R from the wire. So here is the wire that carries the charge Q along its length. And we know that the field will project radially outwards through the length of the wire. That is, if the charge is positive, else it would be pointing inwards. So if you see this wire from one of the ends, the field vectors would look like this, pointing out radially in a circle. Now, to find the E value at any distance r from the wire, step one is to establish a Gaussian surface, and you would intuitively want to have a cylinder like this as the Gaussian surface that is coaxial with the wire and has radius r. So you see, we are purposely taking a Gaussian surface that passes through the point where electric field E is to be determined. That is a distance R from the wire. Uh, let us also say the length of such a cylinder is L. Now we observe that the ends of the cylinder are perpendicular to the length of the wire and we can see that the electric field is parallel to the ends of the cylinder or say the field is skimming the ends, hence we can immediately say that the dot product of E and the area vector of the end caps will be zero. 
and therefore the flux value through these ends would also be zero. In short, no electric field is passing through the ends, hence no flux. But on the curved surface of the cylinder, we find that the electric field is perpendicular to the surface at every point. So the flux through the curved surface is simply E times the area of the curved surface A, which equals 2 pi R L E. Well, if you want to use the integral approach, it would break down as follows. E dot dA at every point is E dA. Since E is perpendicular to every dA element on the curved surface, so the total flux is integral of E dA, which equals E integral dA, which equals E A, where A is the area of the curved surface. So we found the left side of the equation. On the right hand side, we need to know the charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface. And we can see that it is nothing but the length of the wire times the charge per unit length or the enclosed charge Q is equal to lambda L. So using this information, we can write the Gauss law as flux is equal to 2 pi R L E, which equals lambda L upon epsilon naught and therefore E equals 1 upon 2 pi epsilon naught lambda upon r. Here, if the charge per unit length was negative, the E value would have become negative and we would have said that the field is directed towards the wire. So let us go ahead and try another example. What we'll now take is a thin sheet that is infinite in size and has positive charge spread uniformly over it. It is also given that the charge density is rho per unit area and the question is, what is the E value at a distance L from the sheet? So step one is to identify the fact that due to symmetry, you can visualize that the electric field E will point perpendicularly outwards from both sides of the sheet. Then the next step is to establish the Gaussian surface to use that can help us find the E value. Well, we could take a cylindrical surface like this that is perpendicular to the sheet and parallel to the electric field E. And we can see that the surface also passes through the point where we have to find the electric field value. Next step is to establish the flux through the Gaussian surface that we have considered. So we can clearly see that the electric field is parallel to the curved surface and hence zero flux should be considered passing through the curvy part, but the electric field you can see is passing through the end caps of the cylinder and is perpendicular to the surface. Therefore, the flux through each cap is E times A, where A is the area of the end cap. And since the electric field is passing through both sides, the total flux would become two times E A. Next step is to use Gauss's equation to establish E value. Then if you put the flux value as to Ea, it should equal charge Q enclosed by the Gaussian surface divided by epsilon. And the charge enclosed should be the area of this disk multiplied by the charge density rho. That is therefore equal to rho A. So you see E then equals rho divided by to epsilon and this value is same for any distance from the sheet because this is independent of the value of L. Well, you can see when we deal with symmetric surfaces, it is a lot easier to establish electric field using Gauss's law compared to Coulomb's law. And this is what makes Gauss law so much more powerful. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and please do not forget to subscribe to this channel for many more interesting videos.